Hey everybody, today's video is called Promises of Return, and today we continue our pass-through study here in the book of Jeremiah, where we're going to be looking at the promises of deliverance and the return to the land. So after the many chapters we have just gone through that have been heavily focused on judgment being declared on the people of God, we'll see here through chapter 33 containing the promises of restoration and of the next or the new covenant of the next chapter. And so today we're in Jeremiah chapter 30, verse 1 through 3, kicking off. It says, The word of the Lord came to Jeremiah from the Lord, saying, Thus, uh, thus speaks the Lord God of Israel, saying, Write it in a book for yourself, all the words which I have spoken to you. For behold, the days are coming, says the Lord, that I will bring back from captivity my people, Israel and Judah, says the Lord. And I will cause them to return to the land that I gave to their fathers, and they shall possess it. So to see timeline of this prophecy, you'll have to wait until uh, uh, Jeremiah chapter 32, verses 1 and 2 for that. And this occurs right before the final fall of Jerusalem. And it's a general tone of hopefulness and optimism that sets it apart from much of the previous chapters that we study in Jeremiah. And most of the prophets, they delivered their messages orally speaking. And Jeremiah is told here to write down the words of hope in a book or perhaps a scroll, since their validity will only be vindicated many years in the future. And also in written form, his words can be transmitted to those who were in exile in Babylon. And in verse 3, it's kind of like a theme verse that's given in the capsule from the pledge of chapters 30 here to 33. And God's restoration of the whole nation to the land has a view of the final regathering, never to be removed again, and not, not just a return in the time of Ezra and Nehemiah. And in verse 3, it's a summary of the prophecy given in the upcoming verses. And Jeremiah looked beyond his present day and near future to see the latter days. In verse 4 through 7, it says, Now these are the words of the Lord spoke concerning Israel and Judah. For thus says the Lord, I, We have heard a voice of trembling, of fear and not of peace. We ask now and see whether a man is ever in labor with child. So why do I see every man with his hand and his loins, like a woman in labor, and all the faces turn pale? Alas, for that day is great, so that none is like it, and it is the time of Jacob's trouble, but he shall be saved out of it. So the mention of both kingdoms is another hint of this written prophecy is speaking of something later and greater than the return from the Babylonian exile. And while 2 Chronicles chapter 11 verse 13 through 16 shows the kingdom of Judah did contain people from all the tribes, so these words don't demand a greater fulfillment but they do suggest it. And in verse 5, Jeremiah poetically is describing the terror of the Jewish people under a great and comparable calamity. And that day in verse 7 is great. It's connected to the calamity that comes upon the earth in the very last days, that none, nothing else would be like it. And the time of Jacob's trouble seems beyond a catastrophe of the Babylonian invasions and exile. And God will work in and through a catastrophe to bring salvation to the Jews. And God will rescue and bring salvation and protect them. And in verse 6, the anguish of a childbirth is a picture of suffering under the Babylonian armies as also seen early on in Jeremiah 4.31. And in verse 7, the time of Jacob's trouble, you might have heard that phrase before, especially if you like eschatology, is a period of difficulty for Israel, and it's best to believe, believe to be the, a time of 
tribulation, just before Christ's second advent. And that's mentioned in Daniel chapter 12, verse 1, and described in greater detail through the Revelation book chapters 6 through 19. And uh, verse 8 and 9 says, For it shall come to pass in that day, says the Lord of hosts, that I will break his yoke from your neck and will burst your bonds. Foreigners shall have no more enslave them, but they shall serve the Lord their God and David their king, whom I will raise up for them. So a false prophet previously used the symbol of the broken yoke to bring false hope in Jeremiah chapter 28 verses 2 through 4. And we see here that God states that the true promise that one day in a season of time of Jacob's trouble that there will never again be again a yoke upon the Jewish people. And foreigners shall no longer enslave them points to something greater than the return of the Babylonian captivity. Because many times since then, the Jewish people have been enslaved to force labor. And in verse 9, it's fulfilled by the Messiah as predicted back in 2 Samuel chapter 7, verse 16. He is the greatest, <clears throat> he is the great king often promised as Israel's hope, as seen by the prophets Isaiah 9, 7, Ezekiel 37, 24, 25, Daniel 2, 35, Daniel 2, 45, Daniel 7, verse 13 and 14, and Daniel 7, verse 27. And no king of David's seed has held the scepter since the captivity. And Zerubbabel of David's line never claimed to be the title of king, and some scholars see David as the son of Jesse. In verse uh, 10 and 11, it says, do not, Therefore do not fear, my, O my servant Jacob, says the Lord, nor be dismayed, O Israel. For behold, I will save you from afar, and your seed from the land of their captivity. Jacob shall return, have rest, and be quiet, and no one shall make him afraid. For I am with you, says the Lord, to save you. Though I make a full end of nations where I have scattered you, yet I will not make a complete end of you, but I will correct you in justice and will not let you go altogether unpunished. So Jacob communicates God's continuing choice of his people in spite of their continuing sin by reminding them of God's faithfulness to their very flawed ancestor. And he will discipline his people, but he won't destroy them. And in no one shall make him afraid is a promise fulfilled of covenant blessing. In verse 11, it shows that Israel will endure as a people until the Messiah's kingdom, as seen in Romans 11. And God reminded Israel that though they would indeed see the nations that afflicted and them judged, God would also correct them, and God would not allow them to go altogether unpunished. In verse 12 through 15, For thus says the Lord, Your affliction is incurable, your wound is severe, there is no one to plead your cause, that you may bound up, you have no healing medicines. All your lovers have forgotten you, since they do not seek you. For I have wounded you with the wound of an enemy with the chastisement of a cruel one, and for the multitude of your inequities, because your sins have increased. Why do you cry about your affliction? Your sorrow is incurable, because of the multitude of your inequities, because your sins have increased. I have done these things to you. So Judah had no reason to complain. Yet, since the Lord inflicted the wound, and he is the great physician, as seen in Exodus 15, 26, he can restore them to full health. And your lovers, in verse 14, is referring to the nations which they had made political alliances. And God reminded them that the catastrophe came upon them from his own hand, and that there were no accidents, there was no events of bad luck. Or coincidence. In verse 16 through 24, to finish the chapter, 
in one big chunk. It says, therefore, all those who devour you shall be devoured. And your adversaries, every one of them, shall go into captivity. Those who plunder you shall become plunder. And all who prey upon you, I will make a prey. For I will restore health to you and heal all of your wounds, says the Lord. Because they called you an outcast, saying, This is Zion. No one seeks her. Thus says the Lord, Behold, I will bring back the captivity of Jacob's tents and have mercy on his dwelling places. The city shall be built upon its own mound, and the palace shall remain according to its own plan. Then out of them shall proceed thanksgiving, and the voice of those who make merry. I will multiply them, and they shall not diminish. I will also glorify them, and they shall not be small. Their children shall be as before, and their congregation shall be established before me, and I will punish all who oppress them. Their nobles shall be from among them, their governors shall come from their midst, and then I will cause him to draw near, and he shall approach me. For the, who is this who pledged his heart to approach me, says the Lord? And you shall be my people, and I will be your God. And behold, the whirlwind of the Lord goes forth with fury. A continual whirlwind, it falls violently on the head of the wicked. And verse 24, the fierce anger of the Lord will not return until he has done it and until he has performed the intents of his heart. In the latter days, you will consider it. So we see a little scary ending there in verse 24 in a way. But these absolute and extensive promises have yet to been fulfilled in history. And they look forward to the reigning of Christ, the greater David, in the millennial kingdom in the latter days. And in verse 21, we see the governor term. And we're not talking about like a governor that we have in our states here. And, you know, like I got Moore Haley is my governor here in Massachusetts. If you're from Florida, you got Ron DeSantis and whoever else, you know, wherever you're from. Governor in verse 21 is referring, though, to the Messiah springing up from within Israel. And able to approach God as a priest. And the tents of Israel in verse 18 is referring to Israel's beginnings in the wilderness period back in Numbers 24 verse 5. In verse 20, shall be as before is probably an allusion to the time of David. And congregation is the political or religious assembly of the covenant people. And in verse 23, whirlwind Whirlwind throughout a lot of your Old Testament is figurative for God's judgment. And God's judgment is used as a whirlwind, kind of like a tornado that brings destruction and that cannot be contained or controlled. And the judgment of God, one thing you should know about the judgment of God is that it is certain. Because of God's mercy, he may delay judgment, but it will certainly come. And it might be delayed by mercy, but God doesn't change his mind from judgment. And so to wrap up tonight, we look at the writing down of the prophecy in the book for the future Jacob's trouble. In Matt, uh, verse 4 through 7, we see a time of Jacob's trouble. And Jesus spoke here in Matthew 24 in what we call the Olivet Discourse. The Olivet Discourse, uh, Matthew 24, verse 15 through 22. And it says here, Therefore, when you see the abomination of desolation spoken by Daniel the prophet standing in the holy place, whoever reads, let him understand. And then let those who are in Judea flee to the mountains. Let him who is on the housetop not go down to take anything out of his house. And let him who is in the field not go back to get his clothes but woe to those who are pregnant and those who are nursing babies in those days. And pray that your flight may not be in winter or on the Sabbath. For then there will be a great tribulation such as has not been seen since the beginning of the world until this time. Nor shall there ever be. And unless those days were shortened, no flesh would be saved. But for the elect's sake, those days will be shortened. So Jesus described the Olivet Discourse 
of a coming time of catastrophe appointed for the Jewish people to what Jesus called the abomination of desolation. And then in the book of Revelation, chapter 6, verse 17, it says here, For the great day of his wrath has come, and who is able to stand? So, the great day is connected to the calamity that comes upon the earth in the very last days. And a couple chapters later, in Revelation chapter 12, verse 1 through 6, says, Now a great sign appeared in heaven, a woman clothed with the sun, with the moon under her feet, and on her head a garland of twelve stars. Then being with child, she cried out in labor and in pain to give birth. And another sign appeared in heaven, behold, a great fairy, red dragon, having seven heads and ten horns, and seven edoms on his heads. His tail drew a third of the stars of heaven and threw them to the earth. And the dragon stood before the woman who was ready to give birth, to devour her child as soon as it was born. She bore a male child who was to rule all nations with a rod of iron, and her child was caught up to God in his throne. Then the woman fled into the wilderness, where she has a place prepared by God that they should feed her there 1,260 days. So Satan himself will hope to devour the Jewish people. And then in Luke chapter 21, verse 36, Luke 21, verse 36 says, Watch therefore and pray always that you may be counted worthy to escape all these things. That will come to pass and to stand before the Son of Man. So Jesus told us to pray to escape these things. And in Jeremiah 30, verse 8 and 9, it shows that there will be no more slaves. And I also wanted to check out Luke chapter 1, verse 32. This will be a popular chapter here coming up in the next couple of weeks in many churches. Luke 132, he will be great and he will be called the son of the highest. And the Lord God will give him the throne of his father, David. So we see Jesus was given the throne of his father, descendant of David. In Luke 19, verse 12. Luke 19, verse 12 through verse 19. So it says in Luke 19, 12, Therefore he said, A certain nobleman went into a far country to receive for himself a kingdom and a return. So he called ten of his servants, delivered to them ten minas, and said to them, Do business till I come. But the citizens hated him and sent a delegation after him, saying, we will not have this man to reign over us. And so it was that when he returned, having received the kingdom, he then commanded the servants to whom he had given the money to be called to him, that he might know how much every man has gained by trading. Then came first, saying, Master, your mina has earned ten minas. And he said to him, Well done, good servant, because you were faithful in very little, have authority over ten cities. And then the second came, saying, Master, your mina has earned five minas. Likewise, he said to him, You also be over five cities. So we have indications that God's people rule with Jesus over the millennial earth. And people will be entrusted with geographical regions according to their faithfulness. And that's why some argue that David was the glorious portion to rule over Israel. In Jeremiah 30, verse 10 and 11, is a promise to gather and correct. Verse 12 through 15, it shows the incurable infliction. Verse 16 and 17 shows the devouring, the devourer. 
in the verse 18 through 20 shows the restoration of Jerusalem and God's people. Verse 21, 22 shows that the one who draws near. And we see the chapter ends with the picture of a whirlwind of the latter days, which is judgment by God. And that's going to wrap up today's study. We'll see you next as we'll be looking at the glory of the new covenant for our Jeremiah study. So I hope you have a great rest of your evening and I'll let you know when the next study will be. God bless.